Chapter Two of the Doings of Raffles Haw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Tenant of the New Hall. The snow had ceased to fall, but for a week a hard frost had held the countryside in its iron grip. The roads rang under the horses' hoofs, and every wayside ditch and runlet was a street of ice. Over the long, undulating landscape. The red brick houses peeped out warmly against the spotless background, and the lines of gray smoke streamed straight up into the windless air. The sky was of the lightest, palest blue, and the morning sun, shining through the distant fog wreaths of Birmingham, struck a subdued glow from the broad spread snowfields which might have gladdened the eyes of an artist. It did gladden the heart of one who viewed it that morning. From the summit of the gently curving Tamfield Hill, Robert McIntyre stood with his elbows upon a gate rail, his Tam O'Shanter hat over his eyes, and a short briar root pipe in his mouth, looking slowly about him with the absorbed air of one who breathes his fill of nature. Beneath him, to the north, lay the village of Tamfield, red walls, gray roofs, and a scattered bristle of dark trees with his own little Elmdene nestling back from the broad, white, winding Birmingham road. At the other side, as he slowly faced round, lay a vast stone building, white and clear-cut, fresh from the builder's hands. A great tower shot up from one corner of it, and a hundred windows twinkled ruddily in the light of the morning air. A little distance from it, stood a second small, square, low-lying structure, with a tall chimney rising from the midst of it, rolling out a long plume of smoke into the frosty air. The whole vast structure stood within its own grounds, enclosed by a stately park wall, and surrounded by what would be, in time, an extensive plantation of fir trees. By the lodge gates, a vast pile of debris, with lines of sheds for workmen, and huge heaps of planks from scaffoldings all proclaimed that the work had only just been brought to an end. Robert McIntyre looked down with curious eyes at the broad spread building. It had long been a mystery and a subject of gossip for the whole countryside. Hardly a year had elapsed since the rumor had first gone about that a millionaire had bought a tract of land and that it was his intention to build a country seat upon it. Since then, the work had been pushed on night and day, until now it was finished to the last detail in a shorter time than it takes to build many a six-room cottage. Every morning two long special trains had arrived from Birmingham, carrying down a great army of laborers who were relieved in the evening by a fresh gang, who carried on the task under the rays of twelve enormous electric lights. The number of workmen appeared to be only limited by the space into which they could be fitted. Great lines of wagons conveyed the white Portland stone from the depot by the station. Hundreds of busy toilers handed it over, shaped and squared, to the actual masons, who swung it up with steam cranes onto the growing walls, where it was instantly fitted and mortared by their companions. Day by day the house shot higher white pillar and cornice and carving seemed to bud out from it as if by magic. Nor was the work confined to the main building. A large, separate structure sprang up at the same time, and there came gangs of pale-faced men from London with much extraordinary machinery, vast cylinders, wheels and wires, which they fitted up in this outlying building. The great chimney, which rose from the center of it, combined with these great furnishings, seemed to mean that it was reserved as a factory or place of business, for it was rumored that this rich man's hobby was the same as a poor man's necessity, and that he was fond of working with his own hands amid chemicals and furnaces. Scarce, too, was the second story begun ere the woodworkers and plumbers and furnishers were busy beneath, carrying out a thousand strange and costly schemes for the greater comfort and convenience of this owner. Singular stories were told, all around the country, and even in Birmingham itself, of the extraordinary luxury and the absolute disregard for money which marked all these arrangements. No sum appeared to be too great to spend upon the smallest detail which might do away with or lessen any of the petty inconveniences of life. 
Wagons and wagons of the richest furniture had passed through the village between lines of staring villagers. Costly skins, glossy carpets, rich rugs, ivory and ebony and metal, every glimpse into these storehouses of treasures had given rise to some new legend, and finally, when all had been arranged, there had come a staff of forty servants who heralded the approach of the owner, Mr. Raffles Haw himself. It was no wonder, then, that it was with considerable curiosity that Robert McIntyre looked down at the great house and marked the smoking chimneys, the curtain windows, and the other signs which showed that its tenant had arrived. A vast area of greenhouses gleamed like a lake on the further side, and beyond were the long lines of stables and outhouses. Fifty horses had passed through Tamfield the week before, so that, large as were the preparations, they were not more than would be needed. Who and what could this man be who spent his money with so lavish a hand? His name was unknown. Birmingham was as ignorant as Tamfield as to his origin or the sources of his wealth. Robert McIntyre brooded languidly over the problem as he leaned against the gate, puffing his blue clouds of bird's eye into the crisp, still air. Suddenly his eye caught a dark figure emerging from the avenue gates and striding up the winding road. A few minutes brought him near enough to show a familiar face looking over the stiff collar and from under the soft black hat of an English clergyman. "'Good morning, Mr. Spurling.' "'Ah, good morning, Robert. How are you? Are you coming my way? How slippery the roads are!' His round, kindly face was beaming with good nature, and he took little jumps as he walked, like a man who can hardly contain himself for pleasure. "'Have you heard from Hector?' "'Oh, yes. He went off all right last night, from Spithead, and he will write from Madeira. But you generally have later news in Elmdean than I have.' "'I don't know whether Laura has heard.' "'Have you been up to see the newcomer?' "'Yes, I have just left him.' "'Is he a married man, this Mr. Raffles Haw?' "'No, he is a bachelor. "'He does not seem to have any relations either, as far as I could learn. "'He lives alone, amid his huge staff of servants. "'It is a most remarkable establishment. "'It made me think of the Arabian Nights.' "'And the man? What is he like?' "'He is an angel, a positive angel. "'I never heard or read of such kindness in my life.' He has made me a happy man. The clergyman's eyes sparkled with emotion, and he blew his nose loudly in his big red handkerchief. Robert McIntyre looked at him in surprise. I am delighted to hear it, he said. May I ask what he has done? I went up to him by appointment this morning. I had written asking him if I might call. I spoke to him of the parish and its needs, of my long struggle to restore the south side of the church, and of our efforts to help my poor parishioners during this hard weather. While I spoke, he said not a word, but sat with a vacant face, as though he were not listening to me. When I finished, he took up his pen. How much will it take to do the church? he asked. A thousand pounds, I answered. But we have already raised three hundred amongst ourselves. The squire has very handsomely given fifty pounds. Well, said he, what about the poor folk? How many families are there? About three hundred, I answered. "'And coals, I believe, are about a pound a ton,' said he. Three tons ought to see them through the rest of the winter. "'Then you can get a very fair pair of blankets for two pounds. "'That would make five pounds per family and seven hundred for the church.' "'He dipped his pen in the ink, and, as I am a living man, Robert, "'he wrote me a cheque then and there for two thousand two hundred pounds. "'I don't know what I said. I felt like a fool. "'I could not stammer out words.' with which to thank him. All my troubles had been taken from my shoulders in an instant, and indeed, Robert, I can hardly realize it. He must be a most charitable man, extraordinarily so, and so unpretending. One would think that it was I who was doing the favor, and he who was the beggar. I thought of that passage about making the heart of the widow sing for joy. He made my heart sing for joy, I can tell you. Are you coming to the vicarage? "'No, thank you, Mr. Sperling. "'I must go home and get to work on my new picture. "'It's a five-foot canvas, the landing of the Romans in Kent. "'I must have another try for the Academy. "'Good morning.' "'He raised his hat and continued down the road, 
while the vicar turned off into the path which led to his home. Robert McIntyre had converted a large bare room in the upper story of Elmdean into a studio, and thither he retreated after lunch. It was as well that he should have some little den of his own, for his father would talk of little save his ledgers and accounts, while Laura had become peevish and querulous since the one tie which held her to Tamfield had been removed. The chamber was a bare and bleak one, unpapered and uncarpeted, but a good fire sparkled in the grate and two large windows gave him the needful light. His easel stood in the center, with the great canvas balanced across it. Well, against the walls there leaned his last two attempts, the murder of Thomas of Canterbury, and the signing of the Magna Carta. Robert had a weakness for large subjects and broad effects. If his ambition was greater than his skill, he had still all the love of his art, and the patience under discouragement, which are the stuff out of which successful painters are made. Twice his brace of pictures had journeyed to town, and twice they had come back to him, until the finely gilded frames, which had made such a call upon his purse, began to show signs of these varied adventures. Yet, in spite of their depressing company, Robert turned to his fresh work with all the enthusiasm which a conviction of ultimate success can inspire. But he could not work that afternoon. In vain he dashed in his background and outlined the long curves of the Roman galleys. Do what he would, his mind would still wander from his work to dwell upon his conversation with the vicar in the morning. His imagination was fascinated by the idea of this strange man living alone amid a crowd, and yet wielding such a power that with one dash of his pen he could change sorrow into joy and transform the condition of a whole parish. The incident of the fifty-pound note came back to mind. It must surely have been Raffles Haw, with whom Hector Spurling had come in contact. There could not be two men in one parish to whom so large a sum was of so small an account as to be thrown to a bystander in return for a trifling piece of assistance. Of course, it must have been Raffles Haw, and his sister had the note, with instructions to return to the owner, could he be found. He threw aside his pallet, and descending into the sitting-room, he told Laura and his father of his morning's interview with the vicar, and of his conviction that this was the man of whom Hector was in quest. "'Tut, tut,' said old McIntyre. "'How is this, Laura? I knew nothing of this. What do women know of money or business? Hand the note over to me, and I shall relieve you all of the responsibility. I will take everything upon myself.' "'I cannot possibly, Papa,' said Laura, with decision. "'I should not think of parting of it.' "'What is this world coming to?' cried the old man, with his thin hands held up in protest. "'You grow more undutiful every day, Laura. "'The money would be of use to me. "'Of use, you understand. "'It may be the cornerstone of the vast business which I shall reconstruct. "'I will use it, Laura, and I will pay something, four, shall we say, or even four and a half, and you may have it back on any day, and I will give security, the security of my, well, of my word of honor. It is quite impossible, Papa, his daughter answered coldly. It is not my money. Hector asked me to be his banker. Those were his very words. It is not in my power to lend it. And to what you say, Robert, you may be right or you may be wrong, but I certainly shall not give Mr. Raffles Haw or anyone else the money without Hector's express command. You are very right about not giving it to Mr. Raffles Haw, cried old McIntyre, with many nods of approbation. I should certainly not let it go out of the family. Well, I thought that I would tell you. Robert picked up his tam o' shanter and strolled out to avoid the discussion between his father and his sister, which he saw was about to be renewed. His artistic quality revolted at these petty and sordid disputes, and he turned it to the crisp air and the broad landscape to soothe his ruffled feelings. Avarice had no place amongst his failings, and his father's perpetual chatter about money inspired him with a positive loathing and disgust for the subject. Robert was lounging slowly among his favorite walk, which curled over the hill, with his mind turning from the Roman invasion to the mysterious millionaire, when his eyes fell upon a tall, lean man in front of him, who, 
with a pipe between his lips, was endeavouring to light a match under cover of his cap. The man was clad in a rough pea-jacket, and bore traces of smoke and grime upon his face and hands. Yet there is a freemasonry among smokers which overrides every social difference. So Robert stopped and held out his case of fusees. "'A light?' said he. "'Thank you.' The man picked out a fusee, struck it, and bent his head to it. He had a pale, thin face, a short, straggled beard, and a very sharp and curving nose, with decision and character in the straight, thick eyebrows, which almost met on either side of it. Clearly a superior kind of workman, and possibly one of those who had been employed in the construction of the new house. Here was a chance of getting some first-hand information on the question which aroused his curiosity. Robert waited until he had lit his pipe, and then walked on beside him. "'Are you going in the direction of the new hall?' he asked. "'Yes.' The man's voice was cold and his manner reserved. "'Perhaps you were engaged in the building of it?' "'Yes, I had a hand in it.' "'They say that it is a wonderful place inside. It has been quite the talk of the district. Is it as rich as they say?' "'I am sure I do not know. I have not heard what they say.' His attitude was certainly not encouraging, and it seemed to Robert that he gave little sidelong suspicious glances at him out of his keen gray eyes. Yet, if he were so careful and discreet, there was the more reason to think that there was information to be extracted if he could but find ways to it. "'Ah, there it lies,' he remarked as they topped the brow of the hill and looked down once more at the great building. "'Well, no doubt it is very gorgeous and splendid, but really for my own part, I would rather live in my own little box down yonder in the village. The workman puffed gravely at his pipe. You are no great admirer of wealth, then, he said. Not I. I should not care to be a penny richer than I am. Of course, I should like to sell my pictures. One must make a living. But beyond that, I ask nothing. I dare say that I, a poor artist, or you, a man who work for your bread, have more happiness out of life than the owner of that great place. "'Indeed, I think that is more than likely,' the other answered in a much more conciliatory voice. "'Art,' said Robert, warming to the subject, "'is her own reward. "'What mere bodily indulgence is there which money could buy, "'which can give that deep thrill of satisfaction "'which comes on the man who has conceived something new, "'something beautiful, and the daily delight "'as he sees it grow under his hand, "'till it stands before him a completed whole?' With my art and without wealth I am happy. Without my art I should have a void which no money could fill. But I really don't know why I should say all of this to you. The workman had stopped, and was staring at him earnestly with a look of the deepest interest upon his smoke-darkened features. I am very glad to hear what you say, said he. It is a pleasure to know that the worship of gold is not quite universal, and that there are at least some who can rise above it. "'Would you mind my shaking you by the hand?' It was a somewhat extraordinary request, but Robert rather prided himself upon his bohemianism and upon his happy facility for making friends with all sorts and conditions of men. He readily exchanged a cordial grip with his chance acquaintance. "'You expressed some curiosity as to this house. I know the grounds pretty well, and might perhaps show you one or two little things which would interest you. Here are the gates. Will you come in with me?' Here was, indeed, a chance. Robert eagerly assented, and walked up the winding drive amid the growing fir trees. When he found his uncouth guide, however, marching straight across the broad gravel square to the main entrance, he felt that he had placed himself in a false position. "'Surely not through the front door,' he whispered, plucking his companion by the sleeve. "'Perhaps Mr. Raffles Haw might not like it.' "'I don't think there will be any difficulty,' said the other, with a quiet smile. My name is Raffles Haw. End of chapter 2